thank you all. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for your work, your support of the Rachel Corey Foundation. I'd like to thank the, the foundation, to thank Craig and Cindy and Sarah, the rest of Rachel's family, and all the other people who have worked so hard. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing that we have. When, when Craig and Cindy talk about being lucky of what the legacy of Rachel has meant, it's, it's very real and I think very important for us to recognize that it's not only about celebrating the life of this extraordinary young woman, but it's also about recognizing how a legacy has been created of really working for peace and justice. Not only celebrating her work for peace and justice, but having that work be a springboard for all of our work. And that's an amazing opportunity for all of us. It's a challenge and it's a great honor. And I'm very grateful to be part of that living legacy of, of what Rachel's work has, has left behind for all of us. So all of that goes on right now in the context of election fever. You've all been reading the papers every day, and of course all the headlines are about the U.S. wars around the world, right? Isn't that the headline out here? No. What papers are you reading? You know, it is rather extraordinary. This is a nation at war. We are at war in the most intense way with escalating civilian casualties rising in too many countries and threatening a war that is threatening to undermine even the illusion, let alone the reality, of security for Americans as well. And yet, we hear virtually nothing in the context of the economic crisis, now you all remember, it was just, what, oh, 10 days ago, they passed a $700 billion bailout bill, right, to bail out Wall Street. And immediately the cries went up, where's the money going to come from? And we started hearing very stern words, well, you must be prepared, there may have to be difficult cuts, there may have to be cuts in health care and cuts in education and cuts in social security, cuts in entitlement programs. Excuse me, did anybody say cut the military budget? Because what happened just a week before that $700 billion bailout, there was another vote in Congress for almost $700 billion. This one was about $700, uh, sorry, $663 billion, I think, just about $700. That was the military budget for next year not including the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That was a, a separate $182 billion budget that had already been voted on. So you take one step back and say, uh, let's look at this a little bit. We have just committed ourselves to spending $700 billion that's allegedly going to stabilize the market, save our ability to avert a worldwide depression, and we don't know where the money's going to come from. And in the meantime, we're spending billions, hundreds of billions, on these weapon systems that are not only obsolete before they ever get built, but are designed for wars that no longer exist, targeted at enemies who no longer exist, and making everything worse in the wars that are going on. So. How do we think about that? What do, what, do we, what do we do about that? One thing is, we have to look at the election and keep remembering that whatever happens in the election, and it matters a great deal who gets elected, but whoever gets elected, I think all of us are going to have to spend the next four years in the streets protesting. Because while there are enormous differences between the candidates, enormous differences in the dangers of a number of issues, not least of them being who gets appointed to the Supreme Court. The realities of where they stand on issues of war and peace and Middle East policy, unfortunately, are not nearly as distinct as their rhetoric would have us believe.
what we're seeing, and we're seeing it in this last period of the Bush administration, is a consolidation of the kind of escalating militarism, escalating militarization of foreign policy that has been a hallmark of the Bush administration from virtually the day it took office, even before 9-11. So what does that mean in the, in the immediate period? It means that the expansion of NATO right to the border of Russia, the treatment of Russia in the, in the recent Georgia context, all of that we're seeing an escalation of the military side of foreign policy and a diminution of any attention that might be paid to real diplomacy. Poland, the new NATO member, all of a sudden has this new supposedly defensive anti-missile shield, which nobody in Poland wants. No one in the Czech Republic wants the one they're about to get, but the governments there are so dependent on the United States support for membership in the EU, membership in NATO, all these things, that they're willing to say, okay, we'll take your missile shield, which number one, doesn't work, Number two is aimed at an enemy that doesn't exist. And number three is opposed by virtually the entire populations of each of those countries. And that's supposed to be the beginning of a new foreign policy that's going to make us all safe. Now, do they think we're stupid or what? It's, it's an extraordinary thing to see. The latest, and I don't know if you've all heard this, is that for the first time, the U.S. is establishing a U.S. military base in Israel, which is new and different because of all the years of massive, uncritical military, diplomatic, economic, and political support for Israeli occupation and Israeli militarism and Israeli policies of apartheid. There has never been a U.S. base on Israeli territory. For the first time, Israel is being given, has been given, because it's now been established just last week. All of this happened while we were all looking at the $700 billion debate. Nothing else made it to the papers. Israel was given, almost identical to the one in Poland, an ostensibly defensive anti-missile shield. It's going to be, it was manufactured by an American company. It's going to be run by 120, well, I call them mercenaries, you can call them what you want, but civilian contract workers for this company who will be sent to Israel to set it up and run it and teach Israelis how to use it and whatever, and two U.S. soldiers. Why is that? Why do we need two U.S. soldiers? Obviously, if there's 120 mercenaries, they don't really need these particular soldiers. But by having U.S. soldiers, it makes it a U.S. military base. So the message that goes out, just for instance to Iran, just for instance, just to pick an arbitrary possibility, is that if you strike Israel, it will not only be a strike against Washington's best friend, it will be a strike against the United States of America. And you will pay a price from the United States of America. That's the message that we are hearing. So in the context of the election that is about to take office following these years of militarism and months of particularly escalating militarism, what is the discourse that we hear? What is the discussion that we hear? Well, we hear talk, we hear a great deal of talk about ending the war. McCain says he will end the war in Iraq by winning it. And it won't end until we win. And he's going to escalate in Afghanistan, and he's going to attack Pakistan immediately, and Iran, well, you know what he said about Iran, bomb, 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 Iran, you remember that? He hasn't repudiated it to this day. That's McCain. Obama says we will end the war. The war was wrong, he says, should not have been waged. And he says we have a, a plan for beginning an immediate withdrawal of troops so that all the combat troops will be out in 16 months. And we will call that ending the war. The problem is, that is important. His plan would withdraw about half the troops in Iraq today. That means that of the more or less 150,000 troops, something like 75,000 would be withdrawn. 
That's very important. That means that those 75,000 US troops are no longer killing and no longer dying in an illegal, hopeless, failed war in Iraq. That's a good thing. The bad part of that good thing is that there would be about 75,000 left for an indeterminate period. Because what Obama wants to do is pull out the combat troops. Now I'd like to ask all these US troops in Iraq today, which of you think you're not combat troops? Which of you think you're not in combat? You know, there's not a soldier in Iraq that doesn't have to wear full body armor when they leave their base. And you tell me which ones are not combat troops. And yet this distinction, a technical distinction is made so that we will leave behind troops for training the Iraqi military to do what exactly is not clear. To protect the new 1,000 to 5,000 person embassy the US is building in the green zone. And to carry out unknown counterinsurgency operations. So we're not going to have any combat troops, but we're going to have counterinsurgency troops. Now, the reality of what that means, ironically and, and horrifically, is that the combat troops are withdrawn. We're going to have maybe 75 or 80,000 troops left. They're going to be a whole lot more vulnerable than they are now. Because for Iraqis, the occupation is still going to continue. The fact that somebody says, well, we've pulled out all the combat troops is a distinction without a difference. Or is it the other way around, a difference without a distinction? What, you get my point. This is, there's no difference here. You're going to still have 75,000 troops occupying Iraq. And it's ironic because, you know, the debate is going on right now about the agreement between the U.S. and Iraq. Are they going to be able to reach the agreement on keeping U.S. troops after December 31st when the U.N. mandate expires? That's the big moment of truth. And there's indications that right now maybe Bush and Maliki have agreed and maybe they can get away with it, although getting both the Iraqi parliament and the U.S. Senate to sign off on it is going to be a very difficult task. We're not sure. We don't know. But the irony is that for the people who are fighting against the U.S. occupation, I'm guessing that they don't really care whether or not there is an extension of the U.N. mandate or whether there's an agreement between Bush and Maliki or whether or not the Iraqi parliament agrees or whether or not the Senate signs off on it. The only thing they care about is, are there U.S. troops occupying our country? And if there are, we're going to fight them. And if there's 75,000 instead of 150,000, we'll fight those 75,000. And if the 150,000 mercenaries that are now in Iraq remain in Iraq, they will fight them too. So the problem isn't just figuring out how to tinker with the deployments, because remember what both Obama and McCain want to do is send more troops to Afghanistan. Obama says he will withdraw the troops from Iraq so they can be sent to Afghanistan. He's not going to bring them home. He's just sending them to the next country. McCain, I don't know where he thinks he's going to get his troops because he intends to leave them all in Iraq and still have more for Afghanistan. Maybe he'll get them in South Korea. Maybe he'll get them in the US. There's plenty of troops around. They're not very well trained for that kind of an operation. But on the other hand, that's a pretty failed operation anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter. But the problem is we're not hearing a real debate about ending the war. We're hearing sound bites, and increasingly we're not even hearing sound bites. The only sound bites we hear now are about the economy and about Joe the plumber. <laughs> now, I thought some of the stuff about Joe the plumber was pretty funny. I don't know how many of you saw this stuff last night on, on this uh, weird dinner that the candidates go to. It's a, a, a black tie or white tie dinner in New York. And the idea is the candidates, for the first time, they do this every four years, they go and they tell jokes. Now, I got to say, neither Obama nor McCain can hold a candle to Jon Stewart. But nonetheless, they were up there. They had pretty good material. And there were some pretty funny lines about, you know, Joe the plumber, who, of course, I mean, there was some great stuff going on now that he's, it turns out he's not licensed as a plumber. It turns out that he's, he owes thousands of dollars in back taxes. It's, there's, I mean, it's sort of a riot, but okay. The, the point is, that's what we're hearing. 
And we're hearing a lot about ACORN. What we're not hearing about is war, that the US is a country at war. And we're not hearing about civilians who are dying. And one of the things that makes this so dangerous is that we are looking at a moment when US strategy in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and US support for the same Israeli strategy in Palestine, there's nothing collateral about the damage to lives that's happening every day. This is not collateral damage. This is a strategy that is based on the idea that protecting US soldiers is the first priority. And if local civilians are sacrificed to that security, so be it. Let me just read you a brief line that I read this morning. This is today's New York Times, an article about Afghanistan. Afghanistan airstrike threatens to deepen anger in an uneasy populace. I haven't been in Afghanistan since this war began. I'm not sure that uneasy is exactly the word I would use. From what I hear, angry is sort of the beginning of what Afghans are saying. But here's the quote from General McKiernan, who is now not only the commander of NATO forces in Afghanistan, which of course are half American and half some others, but he's also now also the commander of the separate US force. So he's commander of everybody who's invading Afghanistan right now. And he says, and I quote, he's talking about the airstrikes that have been so responsible for the deaths of so many, uh, um, so many Afghan civilians. He says, we will only use such munitions, these airstrikes, against Afghan houses or compounds when there is an imminent threat and when the on-the-scene commander determines there is no other way to protect the force. So if it's necessary to protect US troops, armed invading troops, if that requires calling in an airstrike that's going to kill, for example, 90 civilians of whom 60 were children, like the 90 that were killed last August, they'll do that. And that will be within the legal constraints of how the US is waging war. There is nothing about collateral damage here. We have to be very clear when we're talking about these wars that we're not only talking about US support for Israeli occupation and US occupation of Iraq. We've talked for several years about this notion of dual occupations. Steve, Naiva, and I today were talking at, at uh, Evergreen about this question, dual occupations, and how the, the two are linked, how the US troops have learned from Israeli occupying soldiers who have been doing it longer in an Arab country, needed to learn some of those skills, as it were. Now we're talking about triple, or maybe quadruple, occupations because we're also talking about Afghanistan, we're also talking about the beginnings of war in, in Pakistan, and we still have Iran hovering on the edges that could explode at any moment. And the key here is that when we talk about Afghanistan, there's still hesitation. There still is some reluctance. People still think maybe Afghanistan was the good war. This is the position of a number of people involved in the election who say the problem with the Iraq war was that it was a distraction from the legitimate war we were fighting in Afghanistan. And the problem is Afghanistan's not a legitimate war either. It wasn't about self-defense. Yes, there was a horrific attack on the United States on September 11, 2001 that killed almost 3,000 people a horrific crime against humanity. But it was not an act of war. An act of war is carried out by a country, and you respond against another country. The criminals who carried out this act didn't live in Afghanistan. They lived in Hamburg. They didn't train in Afghanistan. They trained in Florida. They went to flight school, not in Afghanistan, in Ohio, 
They may have been inspired by someone who was living in Afghanistan. That's not a legitimate reason for going to war against a whole country. Thousands were killed in that first three months of U.S. bombardment designed to overthrow the Taliban. Do you remember the story about the yellow food packets? This was one of the horrific examples. The United States was dropping cluster bombs in Afghanistan. And the cluster bombs, when they don't explode, and more than 10% of them don't explode on impact, they lie there and they become anti-personnel landmines because anyone walking by a child who sets foot on them, it explodes and blows off a hand or a foot or kills a child. And these cluster bombs were floating down with little, like little wings kind of that break their fall as they drop. And they were yellow plastic. They looked kind of like toys. And some weeks later, when starvation had already hit in Afghanistan because aid could not get in, because the skies were controlled by U.S. bombers and it had become unsafe. The U.S. began dropping food from helicopters and low-flying planes. And the food was, was wrapped in yellow packages, yellow plastic, that looked just like the cluster bombs. And somebody realized that this was going to be very dangerous because children would run after what they thought were food packets and they would find cluster bombs and pick them up and have their hands blown off or be killed by these cluster bombs. And so the military realized, oh my God, we, we've made a huge mistake here, but we have all these yellow wrapped MREs, meals ready to eat, right, with notable Afghan familiar food like peanut butter and chocolate chip cookies. They're already wrapped and ready to go. They're in the pipeline. So we can't not give them, right? We have to still drop them. So what we'll do, we'll drop leaflets telling people that they should make sure that they're only going after the food packets and not after the cluster bombs. And of course, the United States is sensitive to linguistic differences. So they wrote the leaflets in two languages, English and French. This is the nature of the war in Afghanistan. Iraq and Afghanistan are both bad wars. Iraq and Palestine are both bad occupations. There are no good wars. The era of the good war ended with World War II. There are no longer good wars. There are no longer good occupations, if there ever were. So we have to look at what are the shifts going on in the region as a whole, as a result of these years of the Bush administration's extremism and militarism and unilateralism. And the, the shifts are actually pretty interesting because one of the things we've been seeing for the last, say, six to 12 months is that across the region, the countries closest to the United States are basically saying to the U.S., you know this strategy you're trying to get us to listen to? Nobody talks to Iran. Nobody talks to anybody Iran talks to. Nobody talks to Hamas. Nobody talks to Hezbollah. Nobody talks to Syria. Isolate them, isolate them. Sanctions, isolate. You know what? We think it's not really working. So what you have in, across the Middle East right now are all the best friends of the United States are saying to the US, we don't like your strategy so much. And you know what? We're going to talk to whoever we want to talk to. Because, what a surprise, you don't have quite the clout that you used to. Because you don't have any money. China's controlling your economy more than anybody else. And you're not giving us very good advice. So you have a scenario where Turkey is orchestrating the talks between Israel and Syria. Israel itself is negotiating with Syria, negotiating a ceasefire with Hamas, negotiating with the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is negotiating with Hamas over a unity deal. Um, who else is talking? Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is orchestrating the Afghan Taliban talks. In Pakistan, they're negotiating with the Taliban. The idea of isolating everybody simply has no more support. It's not working. But there's something very dangerous here that we have to recognize. And that is that as U.S. economic power declines, as the U.S. 
becomes less and less able to use the clout of its having the largest economy in the world as a, as a weapon, as they're no longer able to do that because our own economy is in crisis, we're not seeing a concomitant drop in the commitment of policymakers in Washington to still be a superpower. So what happens when you don't have the economic clout and you don't have the political and diplomatic clout that comes with economic clout, what's left? The military. So this rise in militarism that we've been seeing in the last few months, I think we're going to be seeing militarism on steroids in the next period. And the irony is we will hear voices that say, remember what happened in World War II? It took the war to get us out of the depression. Well, we're not seeing a WPA here. We're not seeing the Works Progress Administration giving jobs to Americans, real jobs that are going to build the infrastructure that followed World War II. We're seeing an economy that's based on producing more and more weapons, more and more bombers, more and more bombs, more and more Humvees and bullets, and it doesn't build our country at all. It doesn't rebuild the roads, it doesn't rebuild our schools and hospitals, it doesn't train more doctors and teachers. All it leaves us with is a lot of dead Iraqis and dead Afghans, and to the degree that we do it jointly with Israel, which we do a lot, it means more dead Palestinians. It's not making us safer, because there is no longer any such thing as national security. The only security is international. That's the only hope there is, is that security will come to everybody around the world. So the Bush administration has been forced to make certain shifts. There's certain moves, very quiet moves, even towards a kind of diplomacy, perish the thought. This isn't, you know, what anybody wants to admit, but they're actually having to do that because they can't avoid it any longer. It's the only possibility they have. They have governments they support. The government of, of Afghan President Karzai publicly opposing the U.S. airstrikes. The pro-U.S. government in Pakistan announcing that they are going to negotiate with the Taliban and demanding that the U.S. stop using military force. All of these changes are going on with the U.S. unable to control even their friends. So what happens to the candidates? What do the candidates say about all this? For Israel-Palestine, the two candidates essentially are competing for, to see who can be the better friend of Israel. But there is a big difference, and that is how they frame the issue. For, for McCain, the issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Israeli occupation of Palestine, is part of the global war on terror. Hamas equals Al-Qaeda. That's the, that's the equivalency. And it should be dealt with militarily. There's no room for negotiation. There's no room for understanding what occupation is all about. It's just about suppressing Palestinian resistance. For Obama, I think it's a far more nuanced position. And whether he will end up taking the position that he took at the APAC conference, where he said, not only, of course, I am the best friend of Israel, and Israel is our, you know, our key ally in the region, but I would, uh, I would even, move, I, I would even uh, um, call for Jerusalem to be eternally the capital of Israel, which is a position even beyond that of the Bush administration. We don't know yet whether he's going to move in that direction or whether he's going to return to his roots. But I think it's very important that we recognize that he has roots that are different than that. And in this way, he's different than any other president that ever existed in this country or any other candidate. He has worked with community organizations that support Palestinian rights in Chicago. He had dinner with Edward Said, which is an extraordinary experience. And he's learned from those experiences. Whether he will be able or willing or interested in following that trajectory rather than the trajectory that he indicated at the APAC conference has everything to do with us.
far less to do with him. It's all about what kinds of pressures will be brought to bear. How much will he have to face the reality that across this country people want a different U.S. policy? How much are people going to have to face the reality that organizations like the coalition that I work with, the U.S. Campaign to End Israeli Occupation, that has 260-some organizations across the country who campaign together to educate and to advocate for a different U.S. foreign policy, one that is based on ending occupation and ending support for inequality and instead demanding a foreign policy that is against occupation and that demands equality. It's not up to us to say are there two states or three states or one state. We're Americans, that's not our call. Our call is for equality. If there's one state, equality for all within that one state. If there are two states, equality within both states and equality between the states. That's what we have to demand of this administration and of the next administration. Whether it's an Obama administration or a McCain administration, our demand doesn't change. And that means we have to be building that kind of independent peace and justice movement at every step of the way. On Iran, both candidates will keep the military option on the table, but there's no doubt that there's a huge difference between a candidate that says, I will negotiate, and I will negotiate without preconditions. That's what negotiating means. You don't set the precondition of what you want to come out of the negotiations and then say, as soon as you meet that demand, then we'll talk. Because then there's no reason to talk. There's no incentive for the other side. Why should they talk to you? You've already, if they've already given you what you want, what's left to talk about? You have to have negotiations first. So the threat is not the same despite the fact that both have said that they would keep a military option on the table. In Afghanistan, very dangerous. Here, both candidates have staked out political territory that says their job is to escalate the war in Afghanistan. They differ on where they would get the troops. They may differ on questions of negotiations, but this is a very immediate uh, uh, point of agreement for them and a, a very immediate threat for early in the next administration with both presidents. It is important to recognize that the position that Obama has taken, that he would bring troops out of Iraq and send them to Afghanistan, troubling as that is in terms of Afghanistan, would also have the, uh, the result of discrediting the war in Iraq, and that could be an important thing. In Pakistan, both candidates have said that they would, if necessary, continue using military force and attack within Pakistani territory despite any opposition from the Pakistani government. So there's a huge challenge here for us. The challenge is to build that kind of independent peace and justice movement that will survive whoever gets elected. I think that if, for many, if McCain gets elected, there will be tremendous fear. If Obama gets elected, for many, there will be tremendous relief. But in neither case will there be a sense that this is my president, now I can relax. This is my Congress, now I can relax. We've got a lot of work to do. We're only just beginning. And I think that we are seeing the legacy of these years of militarism, years of expansion, of unilateral domination around the world, that is coming back to haunt the United States. The specter that is crowding out the illusions of those who think that the U.S. can still be a superpower without the economic ability to, to do that, to remain that kind of a superpower is this legacy of empire. And we know what has happened to empires in the past. The, the Roman Empire, when it finally was brought down, it wasn't only the, the emperor himself that was brought down. It was the citizens of empire who paid a huge price because the, the bringing down of that empire was carried out with great violence, with, with fire and with, with death of, of huge numbers of, of Roman citizens.
My good friend Bob Jensen wrote a book recently that's called the, the Citizens of Empire. And what he talks about is the opportunity that we have here as citizens of this new kind of empire, an empire that is characterized more by the expansion of military bases than of sending huge populations to settle all around the world. There are more than a thousand military bases, U.S. military bases around the world. That's how the U.S. is imposing its will. And the, the way we can bring it down, as Bob Jensen writes in his book, is to use the tools of nonviolence, the tools of mobilization, the tools of democracy. We still have some left, despite the shredding of our democracy that has gone on for these years. We still have some democratic rights left. They won't be if we don't use them. It's a use it or lose it situation for sure. But we can use those tools to bring down this empire without the violence, without the great cost in lives to our country, to reclaim this country as something not an empire. That's not easy. It's not easy because our country is grounded in empire. You know, I, I was, how many of you have been in, in St. Louis? A few, a few of you. Did you go to the arch, the St. Louis arch? It's an amazing thing. It's, it's this giant arch on, on the banks of the river. It doesn't even go over the river, as I always assumed it did. It's on one side of the river, and it's just this giant arch. It's kind of nothing. I mean, if, if you're not claustrophobic, which I am, you can actually go in a little cart up to the top of the arch, which I was like, not going to do that. But the symbolism of the arch is supposed to symbolize the opening to the American West. And what's interesting about it, I was out in St. Louis last year, I was speaking at the Convention of Veterans for Peace, and it was, it was this great, it was in the early days before the election fever had set in, and I spoke the first night with Dennis Kucinich, and it was this great event, we really, it was, we had a very good time, it was very fun and a great audience and a lot of participation. And then I had to speak again the next night, and I'm thinking, geez, what am I going to talk about now, because they've already heard me already, you know. So I went out for a walk that morning to see if I could get some inspiration. And it turns out that under this arch, underground, there's a museum called the Museum of the American West. And I thought, oh, this could be interesting. Well, sure enough, I got enough for a lot of speeches there. This was a museum designed to celebrate the legacy of U.S. empire. It was the most extraordinary thing. It was all about westward expansion. And it had examples. There were a couple of voices of native people, leaders. One was uh, one of the native leaders in that, in that part of what is now the US. And it said, it was his, it, it said that his resistance, that the war, it didn't say resistance, it said the war began when they resisted the U.S. troops opening a road, uh, opening a trail across what is now Montana. And I thought it was a fascinating way they used the words. The war didn't begin when U.S. soldiers went into their land and built a road. The war began when they resisted. Where do we hear that kind of language now? We hear it about Iraq. We hear it about Palestine. If the Palestinians would just stop using any violence, there wouldn't be any problem. We'd have peace. Peace is described as the absence of Palestinian violence. Now, put aside the question of the first intifada, which was a five-year experiment of nonviolence, nonviolent mobilization across the society, which accomplished nothing but the expansion of settlements. It accomplished a great deal internally in Palestinian society. But in terms of ending the occupation, not so much. So this notion of focusing on the violence of the indigenous people, if they would just stop, we'd have peace. And I asked somebody once, it was like if today, if all the violence in the occupied Palestinian territories, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Arab Jerusalem, if all the violence stopped on both sides, what would happen? Israelis would have a fabulous life. They have ties with the whole world. 
They're the 22nd or 23rd wealthiest country in the world. They have a state. And they've been promised normalization from the Arab world as soon as they end their occupation. But what would happen to the Palestinians if the violence stopped today? Well, the stopping of violence doesn't stop occupation. So Palestinians would still be living under Israeli occupation with up to 40% of their land in the West Bank unavailable to them, where they are excluded from their own land, where water is used hugely more for the Israeli settlements. They would still face the apartheid wall snaking through the occupied West Bank, a model that is being mimicked in Iraq today, a city, a country of walls, as Steve spoke about earlier today. We heard last week, you, some of you will remember this, from Ehud Olmert, the caretaker prime minister of Israel, in an extraordinary interview where he said, we must give back virtually the entire West Bank. We must give up control of Arab Jerusalem. This was amazing. He said, if we want peace, we have to give back the Golan Heights. What did that mean? Aside from him being an incredible coward, that he was unwilling to say those things when he was in a position to do something to make it happen, it means almost nothing. That's the irony because he now has virtually no credibility in Israel. It's useful for all of us to say, even the former prime minister and current, uh, uh, whatever he is, acting prime minister of Israel has said what we've been saying all along. But in Israel, he influences no one. No one. So what we have seen has been this escalation on the ground the, nine, the 2004 letters that were exchanged between the United States and the Israeli government between Bush and Sharon are still the operative basis for U.S. policy. So it's not just about stopping the violence. That hasn't worked. We need to stop the violence for sure. But we can't stop there. Ending occupation is just the first step to the struggle for justice. And that's just Israel-Palestine. In Iraq, we can't end the war because the war that has been set in motion through the US invasion is far more than just the US occupation now. It is many wars. All we can do is end the occupation and allow the Iraqis to work through their own conflicts. That's not gonna be easy. I'm afraid there will be more violence, but it's, I think, the only possibility. Colin Powell had one part right when he said his famous pottery barn analogy, when he said, we broke it, we have to fix it. We broke it, we own it. Well, we did break it. We did break Iraq through the 1990-91 war, through 12 years of crippling economic sanctions, and through the invasion and the shock and awe campaign and these years of occupation, we have broken that country. But the notion that putting it back together is somehow in our power is lunacy. You know, the real analogy is not Pottery Barn. The real analogy is the bull in the china shop. What do you do when the bull gets loose in the china shop and breaks half the dishes? You don't keep the bull in the china shop and ask the bull to fix the broken cups. You get the bull the hell out of the china shop and write a check for the damage. That's our first step in Iraq. It's only the first step. It's only the first step. We owe a huge debt to the people of Iraq. We owe reparations. We owe compensation. We owe real reconstruction. But we can't even begin that as long as we are carrying out military occupation. We don't owe that. And the irony is, as we talk now about this huge economic crisis that has now hit us, that is hitting poor people in our own country so dramatically, do we even dare speak of what we owe the people of Iraq? It's a huge challenge for us. And it comes back to the question of the military budget. If we canceled the military budget, there would be money to rebuild Iraq 
just like there would be money to rebuild our own country, to rebuild the roads and repair the bridges, and build the new hospitals and the better schools, and train the teachers and teach the new doctors, all the things that we need. But as long as we're paying $650 billion for war in general, and $185 billion for these specific wars, and $700 billion to fix Wall Street, what's going to happen to the rest of our country? There is some good news coming from the Middle East. The, the free Gaza flotilla that sent boats to break the siege of Gaza and were welcomed in, in Gaza. The people of Rafa and others from, from Gaza that flooded the beach with hundreds and thousands of people to welcome these two small boats filled with 47 international Israeli and Palestinian human rights activists. And then they left again, and the Israelis did not attack them, could not. There was too much attention being paid. They broke the siege. That was a huge advance. It's, it's what civil society is all about. It's what our campaign BDS is all about. Our campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions is all about. That call came from Palestinian civil society in 2005, a year after the International Court of Justice had ruled that the apartheid wall was illegal and must be torn down. And yet the United Nations was unable to act. The US refused to allow it to act. Israel went off scot-free. So civil society said, we're not accountable to these diplomatic niceties. We're going to have our own strategy. We're going to take a lesson of the anti-apartheid movement of the 1970s and 80s against apartheid in South Africa, and we're going to use this tool of nonviolent economic pressure on Israel to force the end to these violations of international law. And it's an amazing thing. It was designed so that all across the world these campaigns are going on. But in every country it's different. In some countries it's more about individual boycotts of goods made in the settlements. In some countries, countries like Brazil or South Africa or India, it's about getting governments to sanction Israeli military supplies so that they stop buying guns from Israel. In our country, it's mainly been about divestment, divestment from Caterpillar, divestment from Motorola, because they violate international law. Caterpillar violates international law and violates US domestic law. It violates the Arms Export Control Act when it continues to send it's D9, uh, D9 bulldozers to the Israeli military to be armored and used as tools of war in violation of the US law that says military supplies cannot be sent to any country that are carrying out human rights violations. It's a violation. It's up to us to hold them accountable. Motorola has provided the Israeli military with the communication system that allows them to carry out the surveillance, the, the deadly surveillance they carry out along the wall and throughout the occupied territories. And Motorola makes the fuses for those illegal cluster bombs, the million cluster bombs that Israel dropped on Lebanon in 2006. So we are calling for a boycott of Motorola cell phones, the first personal boycott of this US campaign. Hang up on Motorola. So there's campaigns going on. There's, there's good news in all those ways. The situation of journalists. Some of you may have heard the case of Mohammed Omer, a young Gaza journalist who was given the prestigious award in, in Britain named for, I'm blocking her name, the, the, the great um, Martha Gellhorn, uh, the great war journalist and given in her name every year to a young journalist who follows in her footsteps of being brave and speaking truth to power. And Mohammed Omer, who grew up in Gaza, saw one of his brothers killed by the Israeli military, saw his father arrested, was himself arrested, trained himself to be a journalist, and has been writing for both uh, uh, local, regional, and international media outlets for the last several years. 
was able to get a permit to leave Gaza, not easy to get, spoke in the UK, toured throughout Europe, and returned to Gaza because it's his home and because he's committed to making Gaza the place from which he will tell the world the reality of Israeli occupation. So when he went to return, he was frightened at the prospect of what lay ahead. And he arranged for a Dutch diplomat to accompany him across the Allenby Bridge. And the Dutch diplomat did go with him across the Jordanian side, but for reasons that remain unclear, was unable to, tra to go with him as he went onto the Israeli side. And he was picked up by the Israeli border guards and beaten unconscious, beaten to a pulp, dragged with his face in the dirt until he lost consciousness. He woke up in an ambulance on his way to a hospital and lost consciousness again and then woke up again in a hospital in Jericho and was told that it was because he had gotten this award and the Israeli soldiers were angry. Really they were angry because he told the truth. He told the truth like Rachel Corey told the truth. And we've seen what Israel does to truth tellers. Mohammed Omar is back in Gaza now waiting for arrangements to be made for Egypt to open the Rafah crossing so he can get out, so he can get the surgery that he needs to repair the damage that was done that day at the Israeli border crossing. So there's some real problems that remain, but there are advances that we haven't seen before. The free Gaza boats, the fact that there is a BDS movement in 40 countries or more, the fact that Richard Falk, the great international lawyer, has been appointed to be the UN's special rapporteur on human rights in the occupied territories. There, there is a new discourse in this country. We haven't yet changed the policy. But the work of the US campaign, the work of the Rachel Corey Foundation, the work resulting from Jimmy Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, the Walt Mearsheimer book that broke the taboo about talking about the Israeli lobby. All of these things have changed the discourse, have transformed the discourse. Our job, as we go into this election season is to say elections are desperately important for us and for people around the world but they only matter if we hold politicians accountable it's not the same if Obama or McCain win it's vastly different but whoever wins we must be in the streets we must be in the suites writing the letters, writing the petitions, working with members of Congress, working with any members of the administration we can get to, and remaining in the streets to say it's not just about who gets elected, it's about the soul of this country. It's about taking back our country and saying that what the US does in its wars of aggression in the Middle East is being done without our consent and we are going to fight it using the tools of nonviolence, the tools we have learned from Martin Luther King, from Nelson Mandela, from Rachel Corey. Those are the tools we have. Those are the tools we need to use. And those are the tools that, we're fo that will follow us past this election. Thank you. You've been listening to author and journalist Phyllis Bennis delivering the keynote address at the PeaceWorks 2008 conference held in Olympia, Washington, the weekend of October 17th through the 19th, 2008. The title of the lecture is The Presidential Elections and the Future of the Middle East. The PeaceWorks 2008 conference was convened by the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. Phyllis Bennis is a fellow of both the Transnational Institute and the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. She is a journalist specializing in Middle East and United Nations issues, formerly based at the United Nations. She has worked on U.S. domination of the U.N. leading up to the Gulf War, economic sanctions on Iraq, international interventions, and U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. She is author and editor of books on Palestine, Iraq, 
the United Nations, and the New World Order. Two of her recent books are Challenging Empire, How People, Governments, and the UN Defy U.S. Power, and Before and After, U.S. Foreign Policy and the September 11 Crisis. To find out more about Phyllis Bennis and her work, please visit the Transnational website at www.tni.org. Phyllis Bennis's keynote address was made possible by the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. To find out more about the foundation and its work, please visit their website at www.rachelcoreyfoundation.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots democratic community media. An ostensibly defensive anti-missile shield. It's going to be, it was manufactured by an American company. It's going to be run by 120, well, I call them mercenaries, you can call them what you want, but civilian contract workers for this company who will be sent to Israel to set it up and run it and teach Israelis how to use it and whatever, and two U.S. soldiers. Why is that? Why do we need two U.S. soldiers? Obviously, if there's 120 mercenaries, they don't really need these particular soldiers. But by having U.S. soldiers, it makes it a U.S. military base. So the message that goes out, just for instance to Iran, just for instance, just to pick an arbitrary possibility, is that if you strike Israel, it will not only be a strike against Washington's best friend, it will be a strike against the United States of America, and you will pay a price from the United States of America. That's the message that we are hearing. So in the context of the election that is about to take office following these years of militarism and months of particularly escalating militarism, what is the discourse? that we hear? What is the discussion that we hear? Well, we hear talk, we hear a great deal of talk about ending the war. McCain says he will end the war in Iraq by winning it and it won't end until we win. And he's going to escalate in Afghanistan and he's going to attack Pakistan immediately and Iran, well you know what he said about Iran, bomb, 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 Iran, you remember that? He hasn't repudiated it to this day. That's McCain. Obama says we will end the war. The war was wrong, he says, should not have been waged. Goes on right now in the context of election fever. You've all been reading the papers every day, and of course all the headlines are about the U.S. wars around the world, right? Isn't that the headline out here? No. What papers are you reading? You know, it is rather extraordinary. This is a nation at war. We are at war in the most intense way with escalating civilian casualties rising in too many countries and threatening a war that is threatening to undermine even the illusion, let alone the reality, of security for Americans as well. And yet we hear virtually nothing. In the context of the economic crisis. Now you all remember it was just, what, oh, 10 days ago they passed a $700 billion bailout bill, right, to bail out Wall Street. And immediately the cries went up, where's the money going to come from? And we started hearing very stern words, well, you must be prepared, there may have to be difficult cuts, there may have to be cuts in health care and cuts in education and cuts in social security, cuts in entitlement programs. Excuse me. Did anybody say, cut the military budget? Because what happened just a week before that $700 billion bailout, there was another 
vote in Congress for almost 700 billion. This one was about 700, uh, sorry, 663 billion, I think, just about 700. That was the military budget for next year, not including the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That was a, a separate $182 billion budget that had already been voted on. So you take one step back and say, uh, let's look at this, 11. So what does that mean in the, in the immediate period? It means that the expansion of NATO right to the border of Russia, the treatment of Russia in the, in the recent Georgia context, all of that, we're seeing an escalation of the military side of foreign policy and a diminution of any attention that might be paid to real diplomacy. Poland, the new NATO member, all of a sudden has this new supposedly defensive anti-missile shield, which nobody in Poland wants. No one in the Czech Republic wants the one they're about to get. But the governments there are so dependent on the United States support for membership in the EU, membership in NATO, all these things, that they're willing to say, OK, we'll take your missile shield, which, number one, doesn't work. Number two, is aimed at an enemy that doesn't exist. And number three, is opposed by virtually the entire populations of each of those countries. And that's supposed to be the beginning of a new foreign policy that's going to make us all safe. Now, do they think we're stupid or what? It's, it's an extraordinary thing to see. The latest, and I don't know if you've all heard this, is that for the first time, the US is establishing a US military base in Israel, which is new and different because of all the years of massive, uncritical military, diplomatic, economic, and political support for Israeli occupation and Israeli militarism and Israeli policies of apartheid, there has never been a US base on Israeli territory. For the first time, Israel is being given, has been given, because it's now been established just last week. All of this happened while we were all looking at the $700 billion debate. Nothing else made it to the papers. Israel was given, almost identical to the one in Poland, Thank you all. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for your work, your support of the Rachel Corey Foundation. I'd like to thank the, the foundation, to thank Craig and Cindy and Sarah, the rest of Rachel's family, and all the other people who have worked so hard. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing that we have. When, when Craig and Cindy talk about being lucky of what the legacy of Rachel has meant, it's, it's very real and I think very important for us to recognize that it's not only about celebrating the life of this extraordinary young woman, but it's also about recognizing how a legacy has been created of really working for peace and justice. Not only celebrating her work for peace and justice, but having that work be a springboard for all of our work. And that's an amazing opportunity for all of us. It's a challenge and it's a great honor. And I'm very grateful to be part of that living legacy of, of what Rachel's work has, has left behind for all of us. So all of that, a little bit. We have just committed ourselves to spending $700 billion that's allegedly going to stabilize the market save our ability to avert a worldwide depression. And we don't know where the money's gonna come from. And in the meantime, we're spending billions, hundreds of billions, 
on these weapon systems that are not only obsolete before they ever get built, but are designed for wars that no longer exist, targeted at enemies who no longer exist, and making everything worse in the wars that are going on. So how do we think about that? What do, what do, we, what do we do about that? One thing is we have to look at the election and keep remembering that whatever happens in the election, and it matters a great deal who gets elected, but whoever gets elected, I think all of us are going to have to spend the next four years in the streets protesting. Because while there are enormous differences between the candidates, enormous differences in the dangers of a number of issues, not least of them being who gets appointed to the Supreme Court. The realities of where they stand on issues of war and peace and Middle East policy unfortunately are not nearly as distinct as their rhetoric would have us believe. What we're seeing, and we're seeing it in this last period of the Bush administration, is a consolidation of the kind of escalating militarism, escalating militarization of foreign policy that has been a hallmark of the Bush administration from virtually the day it took office, even before 9-11.